Welcome to our community of practice. I'm Dr. Tara Kirin. I'm a family doctor at the St. Michael's Hospital Academic Family Health Team and also the Vice Chair for Quality and Innovation at the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Toronto. Um, we've been so pleased to be able to partner with the Ontario College of Family Physicians to bring you these community of practice sessions now about every month. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Liz Maga to uh, uh, introduce herself as well as uh, the session. Liz? I think Liz may be having some technical difficulties. Um, so I'm going to um, move on to the uh, next slide. Jonathan, uh, Brian, can we go to the next slide? Um, I'm just going to, uh, you know, welcome you guys to our, um, our, our 11th session. We're really delighted today to have a number of great speakers. Um, I want to start, though, by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge the land on which we are um, hosting this meeting is the traditional territory of many nations. We acknowledge that Ontario is home to many first diverse nations, Inuit and Métis people, and that each of you are joining us from one of those many traditional and treaty territories. We are grateful to be able to come together in this way. Um, you know, I, I find that the land acknowledgement, Brian, if we can go to the next slide, I find that the land acknowledgement is a wonderful time uh, for us to reflect really on injustices that uh, has, have been um, done to Indigenous people in the past, but also continue to be in the present. Um, but sometimes there is also some silver linings, and I, I really appreciated this recent article from Lisa Richardson and Alison Crawford and CMHA, where they talked about how COVID-19 actually hasn't been as hard hitting on, in Indigenous communities um, as would have been expected based on other um, pandemics in the past. And part of that reason is, um, you know, Indigenous self-determination, leadership and knowledge that have guided the Indigenous response. And, and she talks sort of about the, uh, about the approach. Um, and I, so I found this article really educational and, and definitely um, suggest uh, reading it if you haven't. Um, so this is our, net, our this is our 11th, I think, in the series of community of practices, and it's you know never been this uh, you know relevant. Uh, it's incredible that we started off in April. Um, case counts were obviously high at that time, and I think you know we throughout since April we have um, really I think people have valued this space. It's a space for people to come together and learn and share from other family doctors. I would encourage you to click on our website um, to look at past sessions because I think the past sessions often have um, information that is relevant even to today and we're going to touch on a few of those uh, today as well and of course today's session will be available then. Uh, next slide. Um, I do want to give a shout out to our planning committee who um, and together we, we plan uh, the flow of the session as well as the invitations that go out and always looking for your recommendations in terms of who you want to hear from. Next slide. Um, I do also want to call out that, you know, we know that you, you guys, everyone here on the, on the, on the call um, and family doctors around the province are working harder than ever. Yet at the same time, there's, there's been this disturbing narrative that family doctor's offices have been closed and, and some of our patients we know are even have that perception when we know that that's not true. Um, and, and so I, our on Ontario College together with APTO and the OMA SGFP as well as um, our department, we collaborated to um, put out this message to folks um, to highlight the work that we're doing as doctors, um, that we are open um, and if there's this, you know, if you're one of the few patients whose doctor is closed, that there are ways that you can still get care. Um, so just want to acknowledge the incredible work that's being done out there. And um, I think, you know, what's exciting is that we're going to hear more of that at today's panel. Next slide. Um, so we've got a great group of people who are going to share some innovations and also speak today to um, the real issue of uh, COVID fatigue and wellness, um, given, you know, we're headed, we're in the thick of a second wave, how do we keep our energies up? Um, I'm going to um, turn it to each panelist individually to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with uh, Jonathan. Uh, next slide, Brian, so Jonathan can speak to his disclosures. Thank you, Tara. So I'm Jonathan Fitzsimon. First and foremost, I'm a family physician. 
Um, I've given a, a few talks over the last couple of years at CME events, so I've had some modest support from some, uh, some pharma companies that are listed there, and they're my only disclosures. Pyle? Uh, Pyle, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Pyle. I'm a family physician uh, in downtown Toronto at Women's College Hospital. I'm also an innovation fellow, so I've spent the last almost 10 years doing research um, related to virtual care, and I'm currently the medical director for virtual programs at Women's College Hospital. Um, no significant disclosures. I've done some work before with the uh, OCFP, um, as well as the Center for Effective Practice. Liz? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Liz Mugg. I'm a family doctor in Ottawa. I'm also the president of the Ontario College of Family Physicians, and uh, my disclosures are there. I do receive um, a stipend from the OCFP for this work. Um, David? Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, David Kaplan. I'm a family doctor as well from North York. Um, and uh, I am a salary employee at Ontario Health. Um, and I also receive uh, <clears throat> honoraria from the OCFP. And uh, as mentioned, I'm Tara Kieran. Um, I am a researcher and so have a number of um, grants and uh, also some salary support, which I've listed there. The only one from a commercial, commercial company is from Gilead Sciences Canada for a grant on hepatitis C. Um, so we are also really delighted to be joined from all of, by all of you. Um, most people attending today are from the GTA, but there's an incredible number who are outside the GTA, Ottawa, London, Cambridge, Hamilton, Georgetown, and, and elsewhere, which is amazing. So in the next slide, I'm just going to show you how you can participate. Um, there are two ways. So if you have a question, I'd ask if you could please put that into the Q&A. So um, unlike most Zooms, there is a Q&A box. Type in your question to the Q&A and I'll ask all our panelists when they're not speaking, if they can go to the Q&A box and um, type in some answers. In some cases, they might indicate that they wanna answer your question live. Um, if you have something that you wanna share in terms of a resource, please put it in the chat function chat box. Um, so the chat is a great um, way to connect if you want to share a resource um, or make a comment um, or answer a question that somebody else has posed um, because only our panelists can answer the Q&A. Uh, next slide. So, you know, I'm delighted to begin our session and, you know, to begin, we're going to hear first from Jonathan and Pyle and both have been doing incredible work in their communities. Um, you know, leading new innovations to really care for people who may have COVID and who may and who do have COVID. I'm going to start with Jonathan. And I think we can probably end the slides, Brian, because I, I wanted to start with Jonathan and, and um, you know, Jonathan, I know you're working in Renfrew County where there are a number of challenges, including, uh, you know, a, a, a large geography um, with spread out population and not enough family doctors to meet the need. Um, yet you guys have really taken that challenge and um, used it as a platform for innovation um, to really meet that need. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Virtual Triage and Assessment Center and how that was born and, and you know, what, what you guys have been doing and, uh, and what you guys have learned. Sure, thank you, Tara. H happy to do so. And thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to share what we've been doing. Um, I, I mentioned that first and foremost, I'm a family physician. I'm, uh, I'm also chief of medicine at the Arn Prior Regional Hospital. And since March, I've been the clinical coordinator of the Renfrew County Virtual Triage and Assessment Center, which is now commonly known as VTAC. So just to set the picture a little, Arm Prior is about 40 minutes west of Ottawa. Um, and Renfrew County is the largest geographic county in Ontario. So we have 107,000 population, but spread out over about 7,500 square kilometers. So five of the towns, including Arm Prior, where, where I'm based, uh, have a regional hospital. Um, but there are many more smaller and more rural communities. Uh, lots of the population live in uh, quite uh, remote settings, including the First Nation community of Piquaconagon. Uh, many of the communities are underserviced when it comes to access to primary care. So about 25% of our population don't have a family physician. 
Um, there are no walking centres, there are no urgent care clinics in Renfrew County. So for thousands of people, their only access to any form of healthcare is through an emergency department. And then along came COVID and the call for COVID assessment centres. And there was no way that a, a fixed site assessment centre could service our entire population. And there weren't the resources to set up multiple centres, you know, even in the larger towns, let alone the smaller and more remote communities. Um, so we developed this virtual triage and assessment centre. A, a really incredible collaboration and cooperation between primary care, first and foremost, uh, the County of Renfrew Paramedic Service, hospitals, public health, uh, and many other community healthcare providers. So under the surface, it's a pretty intricate organization, but from the patient perspective, it's beautifully simple. You call a single free phone number and you speak to a medical receptionist. Um, if you meet the criteria for a COVID test, you book a time slot in one of the drive-through sites that are run by community paramedics all across the county. For vulnerable housebound patients, a community paramedic can go to the patient's home. Um, and if you need to speak to a family physician and you don't have one or you can't access your family doc, um, you're given a same day telephone appointment with a VTAC family physician. And when we set this up, our, our objective or one of our objectives was to protect our emergency departments and 911 paramedics, whilst also making sure that nobody was left at home to suffer in silence. So if a patient has symptoms of COVID-19, they can be assessed by a doctor over the phone or video. And if they need a COVID test, then they have it done by a paramedic at one of the drive-through sites. If the family doc wants additional information and assessment, they can request a community paramedic goes to the patient home, vital signs, point of care testing, COVID testing, uh, and if needed, um, uh, ongoing assessment with remote monitoring equipment. Now, if somebody has a health concern that isn't obviously COVID related, then a huge problem for us was the fact that many people would normally go to the ED to get their care. And we didn't want people arriving in EDs in large numbers and congregated in waiting rooms because that would be a COVID risk regardless of the actual reason for their presentation. So interestingly, 46% of people who have a phone appointment with VTAC, uh, with a VTAC family doctor, they say that if it hadn't been for VTAC, they would have attended the ED. And yet only 3% of our calls end up with a transfer to ED or 911. 30% of people say they would have done nothing. They would have stayed home and not sought help for their health concern. So we're protecting REDs and we're preventing people from suffering at home in silence. We can link people to all the other existing resources that we have in the community. So from mental health services through to palliative care, you know, services that many people don't usually access because they don't have a family doctor. We've completed almost 14,000 family uh, physician assessments to date. Brian, I don't know if you have the, uh, the dashboard from our website that you can show, uh, just while I'm saying a few of these numbers. Um, for over 4,000 uh, home assessments by paramedics, um, and we've completed over 26,000 COVID tests. So, VTAC's been a lifeline to the people of Renfrew County. We've shown just how flexible family physicians can be and how nimble we can be to change in order to support our communities. And how we as family doctors are so well placed to be at the center of new service innovations that require, you know, cooperation and collaboration with other healthcare providers. And so from my perspective, despite the long hours, it's been an incredible experience. Um, it's been wonderful to be part of such a, a dedicated team. And, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of that with you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That's incredible work. Um, you know, I think we've, we've seen in the chat so many people really impressed. Um, we've got already a couple of questions uh, for you. Um, you know, the first is from Alan Grill and he asked, Jonathan, did you ever consider an online registration system? Is the wait time long on the phone for patients? 
Um, so yes and yes. So we certainly we've considered it. We're working towards it. Um, I would say in terms of wait time, we had a, a, a real problem in mid-September. So back to school posed a huge challenge for us. There was a massive surge. We planned for a two to three time, a, a two to three fold increase in our volumes. And at one point we were six to eight times our typical volumes. Mm -hmm. So for about two weeks, yeah, people were waiting, you know, over an hour on the phone to get through. Um, so that was a problem then. We've worked through that. We upstaffed, which of course you can't do instantly, but we did work it through. And we are in the process of a, of a huge IT shift to, um, to automate our system. And, and that will include a, an online booking option as well. And so a couple of people have asked, where did you get funding for this innovation? So VTAC is an official assessment centre, so we're funded in exactly the same way as all other 140 assessment centres across the province. So family physicians, although they're working remotely, they're assigned shifts, they work by the hour and they bill the, uh, the assessment centre sessional fee codes. And in terms of the costs for the paramedics and our receptionists and our IT equipment, um, that's that's funded under the budget for for an assessment centre. Um, and then there are a couple of um, questions just about your partnership with the paramedics. So um, Rosemary Lal asks, um, you know, that part is really unique. Can you comment on why paramedics versus the usual reliance on nurses or nurse practitioners? And then Gordon Schachter was just really interested in that um, the communication aspect. So is the communication back to a primary care provider when a patient is seen by the virtual physicians? assuming the patient has a primary care provider? Well, they weren't planted questions. I'm so glad you asked them. It's one of the key elements of the success of VTAC. So I, I'm delighted to be able to share a little bit about that. Look, the relationship with paramedics is um, absolutely a, a synergistic relationship. You know, primary care uh, came together really quickly. So we have multiple family health teams, family health center, CHC. We have lots of family docs who work fee for service. So we've got the whole range of models. Primary care came together really quickly, clinicians and administrators. But we built on some of the relationships we already have with community paramedics. Look, lots of rural communities, some remote people. We're, we're used to, to working with our paramedics uh, um, uh, as family doctors. Um, there's also a very um, innovative and energetic chief of the paramedic service, Mike Nolan in, in Renfrew County, uh, who, who has lots of sort of innovative ideas uh, province wide. So we worked very closely with him. We built on the relationships we had with individual paramedics. Um, and it was a case of, well, we need someone to do this in the community. They said we can do it. And it, it, we came together beautifully. And the fact that then there were two organizations, primary care and the paramedic service, clearly working hand in glove, meant that many of the other organizations, hospitals, public health, long-term care, mental health, they didn't want to be left behind. So the sort of power struggles were broken down and everybody just wanted to be part of this now bigger organization. And that's when I said, you know, under the surface, it's quite intricate. There are lots of people involved here. But the nice thing was the, the cooperation and the collaboration. And this all happened within 12 days. First meeting to go live was 12 days. But it was driven by the fact that family docs used to working with community paramedics in our community, built on those relationships and said, if we do this together, we can really make this work. Wow, I think that's like an incredible story of building on relationships. Um, I, I see a few, you know, comments as well that, you know, which it, it, that this is something that, you know, new Ontario health teams um, should hopefully be thinking about building on these types of relationships and uh, collaborative thinking. And, and, and another comment that, you know, urban centers like Ottawa, like Toronto often also have a number of unattached patients. So this type of also service to the community um, for people who don't have a family doctor is potentially also needed in urban centers. Um, maybe, so Gordon asked, Gordon Schachter asked the question just sort of about the communication with a family doctor. Yeah. So, um, is there, so is there communication back to the person's usual primary care provider when somebody sees the virtual physician? 
Yeah, great, great question, Gordon. And, and, and absolutely, that was part of our planning. So the paramedics, uh, so first of all, there's a direct line, a back line, if you like, between the paramedic control desk and, and the VTAC desk. So the paramedics don't take their turn in the queue waiting to get through on the phone number. They have a separate number and likewise for the physicians. So there's a direct link between the, the family doc and the paramedic. Um, when the paramedic goes to a patient's home, they can speak directly to either the requesting physician, but again, because we work shifts, if, if that person's shift has moved on, they will speak to the next uh, doctor that's working, um, but everything's recorded on, a, on a, a shared EMR, so they can access all the notes that way. And then the, um, uh, the sort of uh, the feedback to the existing family physician is done via copy of the notes. So every, the copy of every encounter note goes back to the patient's own family doc. That's great. I mean, I think that's a higher standard than most of our urban uh, COVID assessment centers where I don't think there's any communication back to family doctors. It's usually often just about testing. Um, you know, I, again, lots of great kudos in the chat to you, Jonathan. Um, somebody even suggested that you should apply for a grant to look at the impact of this innovation. <laughs> I don't know if you have already. Um, Submi else? Submitted yesterday. Funny you should say that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've had great support from the, the University of Ottawa uh, Department of Family Medicine. And uh, yeah, I'm in the process of applying for a, a new innovators award there to, uh, to, to get help to evaluate what we're doing. And then somebody asked what EMR actually you guys are using that's all shared with the paramedics. Yeah, hold your breath. Tell us PSS. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so people are just so impressed. Um, and, and thank you, Jonathan, for, for sharing that innovation that I think really brightened our day to think about, you know, the creative role that we as family doctors play and, and, and can continue to play and have the potential to play in all of our communities through strong relationships, not just with our patients, but with other healthcare sectors as well. Um, I'm going to um, turn it over to our next speaker, um, Pyle Agrawal, because Pyle has also been at the forefront of innovation, but in an urban center. And I think, Pyle, you know, you've been doing a lot of work very specifically, um, trying to support people, as we've talked about, who don't have a family doctor, but who have unfortunately had, you know, the difficult diagnosis made of COVID. Um, and you guys got started very early on. So I wonder if you could just tell us more about your program, COVID Care at Home, um, and you know what also some of your approaches are to caring for people with COVID, mm -hmm. and what are some of the key insights you've learned in your journey caring for folks? And then Jonathan, if there are questions for you, if you can, if you can go to the Q and A and answer them, that would be great. Perfect. Thank you, Tara. And thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to spend a little time talking to you about COVID Care at Home, which is a program based in uh, downtown Toronto. So um, a, a very different setting from the amazing work we just heard from Jonathan. Um, but really, this came together very quickly in the early days of the pandemic. So the clinic was actually launched um, in a week on April um, 8th. And it was really a partnership between multiple organizations, including Women's College Hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, the Department for Family Medicine um, and Community Medicine at U of T and, and organizations like SCOPE. And we really came together to see how could we support patients in the community with COVID-19. I mean, we know about 10% of patients, you know, at that time were ultimately um, seeking acute care, but um, we were really focused on what can we do to sort of support patients in the community. And of course, recognizing, um, you know, we see here kind of our, our approach, but recognizing the relationship between primary care providers um, and their patients and looking at how we can support um, that relationship and enhance it while also giving direct support um, to patients who don't have access to primary care providers. Again, um, as we saw, we know that COVID disproportionately impacts certain populations, um, those who already have barriers to accessing care, and we sort of did see that play out in the Toronto region where a lot of newcomers um, and, and such who did not have primary care providers um, getting the diagnosis of COVID-19. So um, to date, again, we launched in early April. We've um, directly cared for over uh, 500 patients with COVID-19 through a sort of remote monitoring program, um, as well as offering kind of uh, 
uh, providers in the community access um, to a hub, so they call a number, can speak to our primary care providers who um, run the program for, for advice, or have access to specialists, including GIM or, or respirology, um, or even sort of inpatient um, care at the hospital as needed. Um, and of course, we try to keep a, a we have a broad referral base, so, so patients from, from across the region. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I think as opposed to going to the details of, of all the kind of operations of, of our clinic, I was, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time reflecting on what we learned from, from the 500 patients um, that we've treated. Again, ours is a very primary care based approach. Um, you may have heard there, there are other, you know, great programs across the region and across the province doing remote monitoring of patients with COVID-19. But I think we are one of the few that take, have taken a very strong multidisciplinary primary care approach. So our team consists of family doctors, nurse practitioners, nurses, social work, and then again with sort of consultative back backup from specialists as needed. And re we really took our kind of clinical approach from this amazing article by Trish Greenhall. It came out in early March. Um, so right when we were started to, you know, the pandemic started to hit. And it's a great sort of primary care based approach um, to how to uh, support patients with COVID-19 uh, remotely. So if, if I encourage you to have a look if you haven't already. Um, and really, even though, you know, this is almost six months old now, um, at a high level from our perspective, it's still quite accurate and, and still the basis of how we kind of, how we support our patients. Next slide, please. Um, so just as a, you know, reflecting on um, our, our patients, our, our sort of clinical approach has of course evolved over time, but some of uh, the key points or the, the, the clinical pearls I think that we um, found most useful. So in terms of virtual management, um, first and foremost, um, you know, considering goals of care. I think that's always um, really important. It's something, you know, you can forget when you're thinking about such an acute process, an, an acute disease, um, but particularly perhaps for older patients or, you know, understanding, you know, when patients may or may not want to be transferred to the ED, have more invasive procedures. Um, and of course, as family doctors, we're well um, that's sort of something that a conversation that sort of we are well positioned to have. So um, something that we've always um, considered uh, uh, with our patients. Um, again, and, and for patients in the community with COVID-19, um, from a medical standpoint, you know, it, it's still as, as outlined by Trish Greenhall, a lot of supportive care. So encouraging fluids, antipyretics, nothing, you know, nothing kind of weird and wonderful, but just the basics can actually do a lot of good for, for patients. Um, the other piece where we've done, um, we've actually seen a large role for primary care, and I think it's been helpful that we're family docs doing um, this virtual care of patients in the community, is the management of comorbid conditions. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about mental health specifically, but of course everything else, the diabetes, the asthma can, can worsen or be exacerbated with a diagnosis of COVID-19. So um, just continuing to manage and, and touch base with patients um, during an acute infection. Um, the other piece where we've seen, um, you know, again, this is not, not quite evidence-based, but we have seen some um, early successes with in inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, so, you know, prescribing people puffers, get reminding patients who have um, puffers to take them. We've actually seen some symptomatic relief of um, sort of the cough and cough that um, accompanies a co often with COVID-19. So, um, of course, we're hearing more about de like oral dexamethasone. I think Jonathan has experience with that, but um, in our clinic, um, inhaled corticosteroids is something that we, we use um, with patients when appropriate. Um, and we have been hearing uh, more around vitamin D um, from our understanding and my you know most recent kind of review of the literature, there's not a clear role for vitamin D sort of acute supplementation and an acute COVID-19 diagnosis. So it's not something that we're doing regularly at this point. Um, and then the last piece that we do is really kind of regular um, follow up with patients based on their risks. So we, you know, um, patients are often referred to us, they get a COVID uh, positive diagnosis, a positive swab at the assessment center, they're sent to us. We usually touch base with them, usually, hopefully by day three or four after, um, after they start symptoms. 
And um, after that initial assessment, we're really um, try to judge their risk. There's, there's no um, hard and fast algorithm for doing this, but of course, looking at age, comorbidity. So we've definitely seen the hypertension, the cardiovascular disease, lung disease, um, putting people at risk for higher symptoms and uh, the timing of the disease. Again, we've heard sort of it, people are most likely to kind of, um, if they are going to um, sort of decompensate, more likely towards day seven, day 10 of, of the illness. And we have been seeing that at, at our practice. So um, all factors that we look at um, for when we touch base again with patients. Um, I will say, you know, even as family doctors, of course, we have a large remote monitoring type setup. But a quick call to patients a couple of days later to check in how they're doing, or if you have an on-call service available, reminding patients that, that they can use that. I think for us, even in our practice, the on-call service is not used very often, but we've heard time and time again from patients that just knowing um, that they have someone to call if needed has been quite uh, reassuring for them. So um, just making use of that, the fact that it's virtual to sort of touch base with patients as appropriate. Um, and finally, the other piece I'll say is, you know, when we started the program, and I, you know, I think this is relevant again now more than ever, we were worried about um, uh, in, like acute care centers being overburdened and, and what can we do as family doctors and supporting um, patients in the community to limit the burden on acute care centers. And I think that's absolutely part of what we do, um, particularly the mental health piece, which I'll talk about in the moment. But we've also seen a lot of patients um, Perhaps the patients who have been the sickest were the ones who initially were the most reluctant to seek um, acute care. And so just again, recognizing that using um, our approach as family doctors to sort of um, work in, in a sort of patient-centered way. And, and sometimes that actually means encouraging patients to go to a, seek acute care settings when appropriate for acute respiratory decompensation. So that's really our clinical approach. And probably, I, if anything, I think the, the lesson here that we've learned is there's nothing magical or weird and wonderful. It's really kind of the basic primary care approach um, that we found has been actually quite successful um, with our patient population. Okay, um, next slide, please. So the next piece I wanted to talk about, and this is probably um, the area where we've seen kind of the most surprising success or um, perhaps wasn't quite anticipated how much impact we could have on the care of patients um, in our early days, and that's really around mental health. Um, again, I think now we're, we're more aware of this, but um, definitely an area that's still un underrepresented. And, and again, most of the remote monitoring programs, I think a lot of them don't in the literature I've seen haven't really been speaking to this, um, but something of course of primary care providers we know is, is central um, towards uh, many acute illnesses. And of course we've seen with many, many of our patients kind of worsening or sort of um, increasing depression or anxiety that comes with a diagnosis of, of COVID-19. And there are of course many reasons for this. Um, the first that we've seen is just of course the isolation. I mean, patients are at home. Um, you know, we've had many young people now who live with roommates or roommates have all um, left. So they're, they're really spending, you know, two to three weeks alone in their home. And, and of course there's a high um, mental health toll on that. And we've heard a lot that even the quick check-ins from our team and, and from our primary care team can really help with that. We've also heard from patients, interesting, the search for empathy. So um, a lot of patients, when they're sort of calling um, friends, family, you know, people that they'd usually rely on for um, emotional support, um, a lot of those people they may have had contact with in, in uh, the last two weeks. And, and you know, understandably kind of a lot of their um, patients usual kind of supports are actually really worried about their own contact tracing or getting testing and and um, a lot of patients I think that's sort of um, just um, increased the isolation so again really a role for primary care to kind of step in and, and support um, we've really heard a lot about stigma um, patients living in in condos where you know everyone in their condo knows that it was them that had COVID-19 at work um, so I think normalizing and acknowledging that stigma and normalizing it for our patients has been really powerful. Um, a lot of ex patients have experienced anger, particularly towards their workplace, um, you know, recognizing that they may have not supported PPE or, or social distancing to an ideal um, form. So again, recognizing 
recognizing that as we talk to our patients, I think has, has been very helpful for them. Um, our healthcare workers who have witnessed disease, death of patients, and, and all the, the feelings that come with that. Um, and, and as well as guilt, there's a lot of patients, um, you know, who have a strong responsibility toward their family or parents and are now not able to fulfill that role um, and helping patients kind of work through and recognize that. So again, I mean, in our clinic, we do have social workers. We've sent about 10% of our patients to social work for um, further kind of brief counseling. But a lot of these issues are like, things that we just sort of deal with and, and you know, acknowledge and, and work with patients as family doctors uh, talking to them on the phone. And we have here some great resources. So there's... Um, these are sort of actually compilations of additional resources um, related to mental health, resources to send patients, virtual clinics to send patients to for further, um, for further support. And I, you know, I, I think we've discussed this before on some of these meetings, but um, the great thing is I think some of these resources continue to grow. So um, I invite others to, to visit these resources to, to look for support for their patients. And next slide. And the final piece I just wanted to talk about was the social determinants of health. Um, again, as I mentioned briefly, we saw, you know, that uh, COVID-19 has um, disproportionately impact uh, patients who are, you know, marginalized patients, have already have barriers to accessing care. And we really saw this come through um, in our clinic, particularly the second half of wave one. And we're seeing it again um, now in the patients we're serving. Um, and I think, it, again, this is an, a critical role for sort of a primary care-based approach to um, help supporting patients in the community. So we actually ask all of our patients about these and you know, we, you'd know, be surprised of, of what comes up. Um, so maintaining quarantine, I mean, of course, we're not public health, public health, you know, all the patients sort of touch base with public health. But really, in a, in a lot of, um, if you know, you have an entire family living in a one bedroom kind of apartment or a smaller place, maintaining quarantine can be quite complex. So, um, you know, as family doctors, we often understand this patient's sort of home situation. So touching base on their ability to follow, and then access to food, medication, um, so asking patients how they can support those things. And of course, touching base around financial stress, stressors. Um, and finally, just trust and authority and encouraging patients to sort of touch base with public health. Some patients um, are, are sometimes wary of that, but encouraging them to touch base with public health. So that's really, um, that's sort of all I have to share at this point. So thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you, Pyle. Um, there's lots of great sort of chat, chat as well. Um, I think people, uh, you know, David Kaplan really called out how you're um, supporting that fourth pillar of test, trace, isolate, which is support. So supporting support with the, the mental health and the social determinants um, kind of focus that you guys have. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. Um, uh, there is a question for you um, as well about whether, you know, patients uh, who are, sorry, physicians who are outside of the Women's College Hospital um, uh, community who are in the community and don't have access to a team, whether they can actually access the mental health supports for their patients? Yeah, absolutely. So um, absolutely. Um, we have, if you go on our website, um, there's a phone number that you can call kind of six days a week and, and family doctors can call that number and, and uh, plug into our team. And then patients can be referred um, to our program if sort of if they need support with mental health, like access to the social workers, or if you just want to chat, you know, we, we're always happy to talk kind of um, to primary care providers. Um, and, and but our, just as a caveat, our program also only provides brief counseling. So, you know, a couple of sessions. And then we as well refer to the other supports in the community for more long term care. Yeah. So um, I just also wanted to pick up on uh, Sarah Newbery's comment that, you know, in her own small community, um, that's up in Marathon, Ontario, the clinic organized volunteers each one day to pick up online groceries, prescriptions, drop off patients' homes so that people are able to stay home. So really important to support people um, in the way that you've described. 
Um, and then Lena Salch from the Center for Effective Practice is reminding us too about the wonderful tool that Center for Effective Practice and the Department of Family Medicine worked on together. So if you haven't seen it, Lena's just posted the link in the chat. It's the COVID-19 social care guidance. We reviewed it at a, a community practice session we had in June um, in detail, um, but it has some really uh, very practical um, resources for your patients, including, uh, you know, I think um, a financial, you know, a, a hub for financial resources. Um, so that's through Prosper Canada, actually. They have a financial relief navigator. So if your patients are having difficulty um, knowing what benefits they qualify for or accessing benefits, it's a great resource. Um, they call out some other um, types of supports as well that we may not know about. So please do check out the COVID-19 social care guidance. Um, I wanted to just also pick up on a couple of other things that you mentioned, Pyle, I mean, you referenced Trish Greenhall's um, great article that was published early in April, and more recently, their, their team has published something on long COVID. Um, so you, you've been talking about the acute face of COVID, and I just wanted to put out there to our audience that actually we're delighted that on January 15th, our January um, community practice session, we will be joined by Trish Greenhall, which is really exciting. So stay tuned, mark your calendars for that. Um, so their team in the UK has done incredible work and it's gonna be a real delight to be able to ask her questions and her team questions directly. Um, I, I yeah. have a question. Yeah, so I've had two uh, COVID positive patients who prior to having COVID um, had very, very early mild cognitive impairment. One of them uh, was admitted to hospital and did fine. The other one didn't need admission to hospital. Both of them now, I guess, whatever it is, six months from wave one, have come in to see me for worsening cognitive uh, functions pretty significantly. Have you seen that in the patients that you're following in your, in your clinic? I mean, I would have see, I thought about it early on because of a sort of more like a delirium on top of their yeah. MCI, but it's been pretty stark. It, have, have we seen that in the patients that, that your clinic's been following? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, our clinic is a is more focused on the acute phase, and we tend to link people up um, who don't have family doctors before discharge. We try to find them a family doctor, um, which, as a note, if anyone is accepting and would be willing to take our patients, please please let let me know. Um, but we have we have been following patients um, up to three months out. We do check ins with them. It is something we see, and of course, in the literature, they're talking about up to you know 10 percent of patients. To be honest, though, at this point, I haven't, I don't think I have anything additional to offer. We're, we're still kind of working through it and continuing to try and understand um, how it might work. And I'm actually excited to hear from Trish Greenhall um, in January around that. Wonderful. Brian, I wonder if you could put the slides back up because I just wanted to share some additional resources with our audience um, from where we left off. Um, we did have a session that was really focused on mental health back in May. Um, so once Brian puts the slides back up, I just wanted to share with you guys um, some of the um, resources for mental health. So if we go to the next slide, Brian. Um, so this slide actually that Brian just had up, um, we did circulate that in the chat and that's through um, the, the webpage that COVID Care at Home has, has a great curation of mental health supports, but I wanted to actually specifically call out some of these CBT um, and peer support um, resources for patients that are, you know, I think most of us know about most of them, but I'll say that I, I myself have referred many patients to Wellness Together Canada, which is a great resource. It has lots of stuff, um, self-help stuff on the website, but you actually can also access, I think it's up to three free counseling sessions. So it's, it's really wonderful uh, resource for patients. Um, uh, I think Wendy Hamilton mentioned that white, Big White Well is now called Together All and it's offered through UT, OT, OTN. Next slide. Um, and so we also do have, you know, a number of crisis lines, of course, that um, we'll, we'll circulate to you guys after the call. And next slide. Um, but one in particular I wanted to highlight again for folks because I started using it after I learned about it in this call too is Connects Ontario. So I think this is a resource that's actually pretty underused and um, it's a fantastic way to figure out what the best mental health support might be for your patient. Um, and they are really great at chatting live, actually. So at any time, I think you can just, you or your patient can chat live with them and um, 
ask them, you know, they, they'll ask you details about your patient, their age, their, where they live, their diagnosis, what you're looking for, and then they recommend something um, for you. So it's a really fantastic resource. And then of course, there's some other resources we have up here as well. Um, so uh, we know that mental health, you know, is a really um, big issue. And I'm going to turn it to, to, to Liz Maga in a moment to just um, uh, talk about that. But before we do that, I, I have one last question, I guess, for Pyle and Jonathan, because I think this is an important one that's come up a couple of times. Um, people, um, you guys have both talked. So Jonathan, maybe I'll turn to you. There was a question for you that I thought it was important to share with everybody, just in terms of um, when people don't have a family doc, how are you addressing that? And I think you actually had a pretty neat innovation that you're piloting. And I think it's worth sharing that verbally with everybody. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. So we looked at that problem specifically. You know, I'm first to acknowledge that VTAC does not provide the full spectrum of primary care. It's not a good platform for um, chronic disease management. It's not a good platform for health promotion, disease prevention. It's an excellent platform for acute episodic care. And so for many people whose only other option currently is the emergency department, this is a big leap forward but it's still not the same as being rostered to a family physician and having full spectrum primary care. So I've, uh, I've been working on a pilot project with, um, with the fam one of the family health centers in the county who have existing funding to recruit new physicians into a salaried model, but they can't recruit physicians to those posts. Mm -hmm. um, so we now have a model, we're calling it VFIT, Virtual Family Health Team, a uh, patient's roster with a physician. The physician is working remotely, but the patient has access to all of the family health team resources in terms of allied health professionals. So if in-clinic care is required, they can, have, um, uh, they can have allied health support in clinic. We have a, a nurse who sort of works in clinic on telemedicine type principles. So the patient comes into the clinic, nurse sits with them, and the doctor is on the end of the video link. Some IT support there, Bluetooth stethoscope, exam cameras. So it's an enhanced virtual visit for the family physician. Um, still working with community paramedics for, for house calls, home visits, uh, some local surgeons to do minor procedures. Uh, there's a sports med doctor that does joint injections. So we're trying to sort of build up as close as we can to full spectrum primary care um, with the family physician working remotely. Um, and again, you know, it might not be perfect, it might not be right for everyone, but when you compare it to the current situation, go to the emergency department, it's a huge leap forward and it's really moving us closer to the idea that everyone can have access to a family physician working in a multidisciplinary team uh, primary care model. Thanks, Jonathan. I mean, that's a, another wonderful example of an innovation. And I think we could have a whole kind of discussion about to what degree can we um, actually borrow some of those ideas for urban areas. And I see a couple of uh, <laughs> uh, things in the chat to that point. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so I think like there's, there's a couple of follow-up questions and, and feel yep. free to answer those in the Q&A. Oh. I also do wanted to just call out a couple of things in the chat. Um, you know, Eileen Comerton mentioned that as a long-term care physician, um, you know, she sees cognitive deterioration in many of the residents with or without a COVID diagnosis, likely due to a drop in socialization, recreation, less stimulation. And unfortunately, the online resources we're talking about are beyond the capabilities of those cognitively impaired. And so that's definitely an important point. Um, Alison Ayer um, also shared a new connect, uh, a resource that I wasn't aware of called counselingconnect.org. Um, so please check that out. Um, and then um, Jonathan, maybe in the Q&A or the chat, you can just answer about kind of what platform you're using for VFIT. Um, but I wanna at this time actually just turn it over to Liz Maga. Um, and I think for me, actually, this session has been energizing, but I know in prior to this session, I was reading the headline of, you know, 6,500 cases in Ontario projected in mid-December, what are we gonna do? Um, and, and so Brandon, maybe you could go to the next slide here and, and I'm gonna just turn it over to Liz, who's gonna walk us through sort of how we deal with our own fatigue, the fatigue of colleagues and our own wellness. 
Thank you so much. So um, I will just say um, one of the roles that I have um, at the University of Ottawa now is as the Assistant Dean Wellness. And in that job, uh, I see physicians, faculty physicians and residents and students. Um, so some of these thoughts come from, you know, that nexus between the work that I do uh, supporting physicians and being a family doctor and this being my lived experience like it is for all of you. So I hope to provide in the next few minutes uh, a slant on this that recognizes what this means for us as family doctors and, and also a focus on the occupational side of this because I really do believe that this issue around burnout and wellness is a, an occupational um, issue and not definitely not just an individual issue. So you may have seen this slide before. This actually is a slide that comes from prior pandemics and what we know happens. Uh, where you want to be on this slide is up on the higher end. If you watch that line that's bouncing about, that's where you're emotionally feeling well and not down uh, towards the bottom. And I've traced another little line on there to show, you know, how what we're going through right now, we know this is exceptional, but even in the terms of past pandemics that we've studied and understood the health, mental health impacts, we're in new territory. So I think we remember sort of how it felt at the beginning and the fears we had at the beginning and maybe those moments where we really felt we coalesced as a team and things were working well in the high. And then now in this period that is a period of disillusionment, it is a period of chronic um, grief, chronic loss, reckoning with uh, the huge amount of this problem that we don't control, the moral distress of uh, not being able to give our patients what we know they need. Uh, and I think, you know, virtual care has brought a lot of wonderful things for our patients. And for many of us, we know that it is an, a tremendous opportunity, but from a just sheer family medicine point of view where relationships um, are so integral, you know, there are lots of challenges for us that I think weigh in around the moral distress um, that are specific to being a family doctor and the challenge of the um, of that virtual care. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the point here is that we sort of knew with a regular pandemic that that disillusionment lasted about a year and then there was some recovery. The research definitely showed that for some, the burnout and distress lasted two years after recovery of a pandemic. And now we're in a pandemic that is going on a lot longer. So just to say, I think it's important um, to acknowledge uh, this is where we are, this is hard. Um, and if you go to the next slide, in terms of understanding the, the, the fatigue that we're feeling, I think that there's definitely a move from looking at this as an acute stress response that we're having to a chronic stress model. And, you know, it's interesting to consider some of these factors that I've laid out here in terms of how we're feeling and how we're coping that you know, in an acute stress model, the focus really was on supporting others. Um, it's that, you know, fight or flight, you're physically more efficient. Um, and, a, and a shorter recovery time. And now with chronic stress, what we know is actually that the focus turns inward. Physically, we're not in that place um, of being more um, efficient. Um, cognitively, we're foggy. Um, and I mentioned there the mental health issues, and I'm definitely seeing that in my work, uh, an increased number of uh, our physicians and our residents um, presenting with mental health issues, rising rates of addiction and substance abuse. So, um, and a much longer uh, recovery time. So this is, you know, I think what I would also say is we know from the research that while the stressor itself may go on, there are things we can do to help ourselves manage with the stress, that there is a detachment between those things that can permit us to um, uh, bolster our capacities to be in a place of recovery while the stressor is going on. And so if you just go to the next slide. Um, if we think about that concept of, of recovery and, and what we need as family doctors, I really loved this model. It was just released by the um, BC Family Doctors and it uses Maslow's hierarchy to take a look at what do we need to feel well? 
And at the bottom there, you know, we have health and well-being. Those are the foundational pieces. And I know we know them all, what those, those things are. It is hard when we're all under stress to remember to do those things. So just, um, I will leave it there, but please know self-care is not a selfish thing. It is really important. We need uh, to look after ourselves because this is going to go on. It's not a marathon, it's a marathon after a marathon after a marathon. But then building upwards, you know, safety and security, and that includes security, financial security, this, uh, the financial impact, particularly on some of our uh, fee-for-service colleagues, especially has been enormous. Moving up to practice supports, you know, primary care is fragile. And um, some of us work in practices where we have a lot of support and others don't. Uh, so that part is essential. Moving up to community, how are we connecting? And again, you know, if, if you're working by yourself in a small practice, where you know, may be more challenging for you to connect with community colleagues, which is why opportunities like exactly this phone call and this uh, or this webinar that we're doing and gathering as a group, as a community of practice, can be important. Uh, and then respect that uh, we acknowledge and value family medicine and primary care. And then finally agency, that we are engaged uh, within the system in change, that we uh, are building capacity in our leadership so that we are uh, integral to what is happening. So I really like this. There's a whole document that surrounds it and I would recommend you take a look. Next slide. So these are the personal side of coping with COVID and, and um, I'm not, going to go into this in detail. I do um, think these four C's are really a wonderful way to um, encapsulate the things that we need to be doing. Um, it isn't easy. And uh, I can tell you, you know, I, I talk about this all day in my job um, at the university and I have to work at this. Um, so letting go what I, of what I can't control, you know, that's, it's hard to do. Um, so I won't, um, I won't get into this in more detail, but I do firmly believe, you know, this is the foundational part of that um, pyramid that you just saw. I wanted to turn to the next slide, which pivots a bit um, to taking a look at, you know, from an organizational point of view, you know, what, what can we, how can we look at this? And Tate Shanafelt, who is an American, um, physician and really one of the leaders in North America around physician wellness came up with this model around hear me, protect me, prepare me, support me and care for me. And I find it really helpful individually to really um, examine the anatomy of my stress. Where is that coming from on, in each of these five pillars? And this article that he wrote supports those pillars with activities um, at an organizational level and things, you know, some of it for sure is related to a hospital structure and we don't have those structures in many cases. I know some of you do work obviously in hospitals, but many of us in the community may not have that. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I feel like it animates it with some good examples. And um, I'll just go to the next slide. So, I have looked very hard for research that explores, um, you know, what is the experience of family physicians specifically in the workplace during COVID? There's a lot that's been written about, you know, we're all more burned out and, and we're finding this hard. And, and I think we know that. Um, and, uh, but there's much less about, you know, we, what is really happening on the ground that's making a difference. So I want to turn to this and I acknowledge it's a study of pharmacists, but I think it's relevant. It's a recent study. It was done in Ontario. It was a qualitative study. They interviewed um, pharmacies, all different types, and it models in some ways what our experience is, some small um, family pharmacies in rural areas, some large pharmacies in, um, you know, big, big box pharmacies that have lots of support. Um, so bear with me, I understand it's not, uh, it's not a family doctor, but I think there are links here. And fundamentally what they found was personal and practice resilience were connected. And these measures underneath, so key in, in terms of identifying what were the practice pieces that led to the practice itself being resilient in the face of COVID uh, and then fed back to personal resilience. I'm going to stop there because I know we're just coming to the end, um, but I would, uh, I found this, um, you know, there are some specific uh, tips there that I would point Liz, uh, I think you, people I to think consider. You go to the next slide, actually, because. Okay, next, next slide. <laughs> all right, so this, uh, we will give this to you. All of these are linked um, when, um, to resources. So I just want to let you know you are not alone. There is a, the one thing about COVID is it definitely has revealed 
um, that many people um, are out there to support us as physicians. I'm, I list a number here that range from the OMA Physician Health Program um, uh, down to some that are more uh, online or virtual resources like the CMA Wellness Hub and the ECHO uh, Coping for COVID. Um, so I will leave that with you. And again, mindful of time, I may, maybe I'll pass it back to you, Tara, to uh, finish us off. Yeah, so just wanted to, you know, so thank you, first of all, Liz, for just, I think, allowing us to take this moment to reflect on our own mental well-being, uh, acknowledging the distress that I think many of us are feeling and um, how that is normal um, in today's abnormal world and what we can do about it. I, I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, I, I appreciated the slides you shared, and I think we're going to be sharing these links um, with all of the people attending um, following the session. So don't fear, um, lots of great resources here and you will get the links. Ryan, maybe I'll just go to the uh, second last slide, if that's possible. Um, so, um, you know, in general, I would also encourage our attendees to take a look at the OCFP and the Center for Effective Practice for some great other additional resources, both for COVID and um, in the case of the OCFP, I think also for the practicing physician and supports related to that. Um, next slide. Um, I think, you know, we're delighted to have so many of you guys attend on a regular basis. And I just wanted to let you know that our next session will be in December 11th. We want to hear from you in terms of what topics you think would be fruitful, whether there's some interesting innovations across the province that you would think we should feature. We always appreciate those recommendations. And as mentioned in January, we will be joined by Trish Greenhall. So we're really delighted by that. And that's January 15th. So just mark your calendars for that. Um, our webinar um, uh, recording will be available on the DFCM website at that link uh, following today, along with the curated list of resources. Um, and so please do go ahead and share with your colleagues. Of course, today's session was also accredited and you should get a certificate with, by email in the next uh, one to two weeks. So thank you everybody for joining um, today. And Take care, take care of yourselves. We know you take care of your patients, but today I'll say also, please take time to take care of yourself. Thank you.